go over the systematic approach. My advice to you, right, uh, if you apply the rules that you learned here, you will be in a ballpark uh, in terms of your EKG interpretation. What I mean by that is when any EKG comes up on the screen for your strip, right, at least you'll have a, some sort of an idea what to write down. I mean, you're not going to say, oh, I didn't write anything. It's blank. I didn't know what to put down. At least you'll have some sort of a uh, method to do this. So this is based on the book, right? So we're going to do an organized collective approach to this, right? This is essentially the framework, right, for your approach. So we're going to, when you are presented with the strip, as long as you jot these things down on your paper, right, or in your mind, uh, the more uh, experienced you become, right, this is how we're going to arrive. And we'll do some practice strips so you see how it's done. So we're going to look if rhythm is regular or irregular. We're going to know that. We're going to do rates, and rates can be determined by a couple of ways. One is you could count the number of QRS complexes in a six-second strip, times that by 10, or you could do the box method, 300, 150, 175. I'm going to show you both methods. If your rhythm is irregular, right, so your complexes are not one right after another, you want to use that, uh, you know, six-second strip, times it by 10. If your rhythm is regular, the best method to use is the box method, right? Then we're going to see if there's two areas in front of. Yes, you have a question? A question about rates. Yeah. Um, can you count the ectopic Yeah, we're going to count We're going to count the ectopic beats. I'm going to show you more in depth once we get to that, right? But this is only here just to give you an overview. So there's two methods box method, right? And if your rhythm is irregular, we're going to do the R weights in a six second strip time by 10. But I'll get to your question. Few ways, right? We wanna we wanna basically look if there's a few wave in front of every QRS that tells us if there's extra P waves and not a QRS following it, maybe we're dealing with some sort of a hard block. PR interval is basically this is king to determine your hard block. So anytime anytime there is a question, right, is a hard block, I'll ask what's the PR interval going? If you learn the method of going, going, gone, that second degree type one or winky box, right, that's the wrong way to approach this. That's pattern recognition. Right? And second degree type 1 has nothing to do with going, going on. Right? It has to do with variable PR interval. We're going to talk more in depth about that. Right? And then we're going to measure our QRS complexes. This basically tells us, right, if it's narrow, if it's narrow, less than 0 0.12 seconds, it's coming from above the ventricles. If it's wider than 0 0.12 seconds, it's probably ventricular in nature, right? Or maybe it's lower in the junction. So when you are when you're looking at the EKG, right, what you're going to do is I'm going to show you uh, some of the methods, but let's say you have a piece of paper, or another thing you could buy calipers, right? For regularity, the easiest thing to do is if you say you have an EKG, you mark, mark off your R to R, and you march across the <coughs> to see if your R to R is aligned. If they align, your rhythm is regular. The moment it doesn't align, even in 41 b it becomes irregular, right? If there is a pattern to the irregularity, meaning you have a normal beat, a topic beat. Regular, regular. Normal beat, a topic beat. That's called regularly irregular. So it means there's a pattern. If, let's say, you have a rhythm such as atrial fibrillation, right, it's just you have a QRS, you know, then no P waves, another QRS, right, another QRS, there's no pattern to it. We call it irregularly irregular. There's no pattern to it. And why do I say regularly irregular, regular, and so forth? So uh, this book, right, the one that we're going through, in the back, there is flashcards. And the flashcards actually have all the criteria for every single rhythm, such as sinus rhythm, wandering atrial pacemaker, uh, AFib, first degree, second degree, third degree, uh, any type of technique, dysrhythmias, SVTs. So they'll tell you the criteria. So they'll tell you the rate, they'll tell you the regular, irregular. This stuff, right, what I would do is I would cut these out, put them in a Ziploc bag, have it in my pocket on the rotation, I'll go through this, right? It will take you maybe a few minutes to do it. These rhythms must be committed to your memory so that the moment you determine, okay, I have an irregular rhythm, you right away can exclude certain things. I know it's not sinus rhythm. It's not sinus tachycardia, right? It's not ventricular tachycardia. Because the rhythm is irregular. So right away, right, I'm starting to say maybe it's AFib. Maybe there is, you know, some sort of a heart block. Second degree type 1, second degree type 2, right? Multifocal atrial tachycardia, sinus arrhythmia, right? So the rhythms that are irregular start to be on my mind, you know, right away. So I'm excluding the ones that are regular. Does that make sense to you? Right. So that's how we want to approach. You want to be systematic in this? Rate, right? So we want to know the exact rate, and we're going to basically do the rate for both the atria and the ventricle, right? Why I say this, because you may have uh, rhythms, for example, uh, atrial flutter, 
where the ventricular rate is maybe 60, but the atrial rate may be 350, right? So it's a good idea to get into a habit of doing this, right? In a third degree heart block, you may have an atrial rate that's 80 and ventricular rate that's 40. So, but they're gonna be regular, so you will see that. So it's a good idea when you're starting out to both have the atrial rate and ventricular rate when you target them, right? We talked about P waves. If the, if the origin is SA node, they're usually uniform in nature, they look the same, right? And they precede the QRS complex. The moment P waves morphology changes, let's say you have one P wave that's like pointy, the other one has like M shape to it, the other one looks like kind of biphasic up and down, right? But you know the origin is not the SA node. Maybe it's coming somewhere in the atria, maybe you have a, a wandering atrial pacemaker. So that's why we look at the morphology of the P waves, right, to determine if they're the same or not. PR interval, right, what's the normal uh, range? <laughs> Excellent, right? 0. 0. 0.12 seconds to 0. 0.20 seconds. The moment we exceed 0. 0.20, perhaps we're dealing with some sort of a hard block, right? First degree hard block comes to mind, right? That's the only hard block where you have to give an underlying rhythm. So you cannot just say first degree hard block. You got to say, I have a sinus bradycardia, this rhythm, I have sinus bradycardia, this first degree. I have sinus rhythm, first degree. Sinus tax, this first degree. Any type of second degree and third degree, you could just state the hard block. You don't have to tell me the underlying rhythm. Right? Uh, QRS complex, we said normal duration is less than or equal to 0 0.12 seconds. Greater than that, that means that most likely you have a ventricular origin, right? Or maybe there is some sort of a bundle branch block associated with that. Uh, so let's do the uh, calculation of the heart rate. So they'll tell you, count the number of these big boxes. So and it starts with 300, 150, 100. The other method is count the small numbers and divide by uh, 1500. This would be the most accurate method, right? Uh, you would probably either have to be really good at math or use a calculator, right, to do this. This is probably, I think, much more effective for you guys, right? So they they will give you these numbers: 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50. I'll commit these to memory, right? So I'll show you some examples, right? So how would I would do it, right? So if I were to do the the method that I was showing you, let's say first we're going to get the rate, right? One method you said is you could count the number of boxes, uh, sorry, uh, R waves, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve times ten? 120, right? How do I know this is a six second strip? The line on top? Hash, hash marks. From here to here is three seconds, from here to here is another three seconds. Altogether six seconds. Make sense? But so we said 120, but I don't know if my rhythm is regular or irregular. So if I had this on my <coughs> on my desk, what I would do is I'll take my piece of paper and I'll mark off my R to R. And then I'll march it across the paper. So it seems like they're matching, <coughs> right? The moment any one of these beats stops to match, I have what, what type of rhythm? Irregular. irregular, right? So, so far it doesn't seem that, it seems as though everything is matching, yes? So if it's matching, I would probably do the box method. So what I would do is, I marked off my R to R. What I would do is then I move this to a thick line. You see how I'm on my big box? The next one is going to be 300. The next one is 150. The next one is 100. So it's right in the middle. So I would say my heart rate is maybe 125. Right? And we said before it was 120. Right? Uh, the other method that I said is the most accurate is to count the small boxes and divide it by 1500. So here, right, you see how it falls exactly on the thick line, the R wave? So I'll count the small boxes. So I know there's five here, plus another five, that's 10. And there's two more here, 12, right? Anyone has a calculator? So those 1,500 divided by 12? 125. Uh, 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 yeah, 1,500 divided by 12, 125? Right, so 125. So the, box, the 1,500 would be the most accurate. The 300 box method will be the second accurate, and then to do this, right, times 10 will be the, the, the least accurate. However, you need to do the last method when you have an irregular rhythm. <coughs> Make sense? Say again? The last, the last one, when you, when you count times by 10, that's the ones you want to employ for an irregular rhythm, like AFib, right, or any type of uh, activity that you see that makes the rhythm irregular. Uh, so the next thing I would do is I would see if my QA is in front of every QRS, they, they are. The morphology looks similar, right, or the same. I will check if my PR interval is prolonged. So the best thing to do is you just morph off your PR interval like this. 
right? And then I move it on a big bus and I see if it's longer. It's not, right? It's, it's about four small buses, 0 0.6 in a second. I do the same for my QRS complex. So my QRS will be here and here. It looks like it's uh, maybe two and a half buses. So it's not greater than 0 0.12 seconds, right? And now what I would do is if I was just jotting this down on my paper, I would write rate uh, 125, right? I'll write my, there's a P wave in front of every QRS, morphology is the same. PR interval is, right, four boxes. QRS duration is two and a half boxes, or I'll write my second. Right? There's a P wave in front of every QRS, type in nature, right? So then I, I start to, in my mind, think of the rhythms that are regular, that are fast, right? So the moment we exceed 100, we're dealing with a tachycardia. Because there's uniform P waves in front of every QRS, how would I call this rhythm? Frame stack. Frame stack. Sorry, right? And I would write this up. So let's say you're sitting here and you are, you look at this, you're like, I have no clue what this is, right? At least if you've got the rate, and if it's regular, regular, you could have at least wrote tachycardia, right? So you should have something on your paper. You follow what I'm saying? All right. We're going to go to the next example. All right, so this one, right? So we'll do the same thing. First, we'll do the rate, right? So you could do the, you could do, uh, right? Uh, count the R waves, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seventy, right? So you can do the box method. So here, right? Three hundred, one fifty, one hundred, seventy-five, sixty. So it's uh, closer uh, towards this end, right? So maybe I don't know, maybe seventy, right? So we got the same thing: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seventy, maybe sixty-eight, right? All this. The next I look if there is. Uniform P waves, they don't look uniform, they look like they have an M shape, right? So something is going on here. Is there a P wave for every QRS? It seems as though there is, right? Uh, then I gotta see what's my PR interval, right? So I will mark off the start of the P wave up to here, and then I move it on a thick box. You see how it's bigger than one box? It's one, one full box, one full and one small. So is my PR interval normal or prolonged? Prolonged. My QRS looks tight in nature, right? So I haven't seen any problems with this. So I have, it seems as though I have sinus rhythm, but prolonged PR interval, so what, how would I call this? First degree block. Sinus rhythm with first degree hard block, right? Make sense? For the first degree hard block, you gotta check the other line rhythm. Alright, so now we, now we get a little bit more tricky, right? And so now you guys are gonna start saying, well, this is not the pattern that they told us, right? So let me get a marker, get a bigger. So first thing, let's determine the rate. How would I determine the rate? So can I do the box method here? No. 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 Why not? Irregular. irregular. Yeah, it's irregular. So I have to do one, two, three, four, and this one is here, so five, right? Our rate of 50, right? The next thing I gotta do is do I have a P wave for every QRS? Yep. Yeah. P wave, P wave, P wave, <coughs> P wave. What about this one? There's no QRS. So do I have a P wave for every QRS? No. So this one is missing a QRS. Wait, yes, you have a P wave for, for every QRS. QRS. You don't have a QRS. Good, very good. I, I'm glad you caught that. So extra P waves. Not enough QRS. Excellent, right? Now I gotta measure my PR, PR interval. So let's let's start with, with this one. And then we'll move our way to here. So this one, I could, I could already tell it's going to be prolonged, right? So it's, I could tell it's already bigger than one whole box. But if I move it here, you notice, you notice that this is even longer. This PR interval is longer. I move here, this, this one is shorter, right? I move here, this one is longer. And here, right, this one is shorter. So. Do I have going, going, gone pattern? No, I don't. But what do I have? Variable PR interval. What's the hallmark of a second degree type one? Variable PR interval and an irregular, in an irregular, right rhythm. So it doesn't have to be going, going, gone. The moment I have irreg, I have variable PR interval means it varies. Like you see how this is smaller, this is bigger, this is smaller, so it varies. And the moment, right, I have extra P waves without a QRS, right? I'm dealing with a hard one. Question, mm -hmm. what if this P wave wasn't here? Meaning this strip has everything that we have here and this wasn't here. Do we have a hard block or not? Uh, 
Are we ready? So raise your, raise your hand if you still think it's going to be second degree type one. <coughs> what I'm saying is everything is the same. This P, this P, P wave doesn't exist. It's just a nice little electric line to the next complex. Raise your hand if you still think it's second degree type one. All right, those, okay, so a couple of you think it's second degree type one. Those of you who have your, did not raise your hands, what do you think this is then? I think that's a third degree hard block. Third degree, so we, we remove, we remove a few and it becomes a third degree hard block? No. No. No, right? So to answer your question is this, this, even if this P wave was not here, this would still be second degree type one. Maybe if I had a longer strip, right, if I continue printing it, I will find eventually a P wave that's not conductive. But the moment you have variable PR intervals, you're probably dealing with second degree type one. So your strip doesn't necessarily have to have a P wave that doesn't have a pure resonance. If I had a longer strip, you follow what I'm saying? If I kept printing it, maybe I'll find eventually a P wave that's, that doesn't have a pure with it. So it doesn't, the strip doesn't necessarily have to have it. The moment I have variable PR interval, I'm dealing with that. All right? The next one would be the same, right? So this, this rhythm looks regular to me, right? But you always want to you, you always want to check. Let's get the rate, right? One, two, three, four. Four times ten is 40. forty, right? Do I have a P wave for everyone? Yeah. I have no. a P wave. No, I don't, right? There's a P wave here. There's a P wave here. There might be a P wave here. There's a P wave here. There's a P wave, but I don't know what's there, right? So now, so now I know my heart rate is forty, right? I want to I want to measure my PR interval. But it seems as though I have a variable PR interval, right? But the other thing I want to also look is, uh, is my underlying rhythm, is it irregular, right? And if I were to measure my R to R, let's get out another paper. So let's see if our R to R. So our R to R looks regular, right? Yeah, so it's a regular rhythm, right? <clears throat> so the moment I have a regular rhythm, I'm probably not dealing with the second degrees. I'm not dealing with second degrees. Second degrees are usually going to be in a regular rhythm. The next thing I want to do is I want to see, right? So my ventricle is definitely mapped out. I want to see if my P wave is mapped out. So then I'll, I will look at these P waves here, right? This looks like a P wave, this looks like a P wave, this looks like a P wave. So I'll just mark off this, these two. And then I move it across. So my P wave is matched up. My P wave is matched up. And my P wave is matched up. This is, this is a little blip, there's a P wave here. My P wave is matched up. And this is probably hidden in the pure ass. And then it again matches up, right? So I have each here that's beating at their own rate and ventricles beating at their own rate. So we know the ventricular rate is 40. What's my atrial rate? So we mark this off, right? So I move over the big box. So I do 90. 300, 150, 175. So maybe 85 around there, right? So atrial rate is maybe 85, ventricular rate is 40. Right? So what am I dealing with here? 30 degree hard block, right? So if you apply the systematic approach and you do what I'm what I'm showing you, right, you will get to the correct interpretation, right? Usually at third degree, you have a regular rhythm. You have, you have, not, you have basically some sort of a abnormality that atria or SA node is not communicating, right, through the AV node, right, through the ventricle. So atria is at the own rate, ventricles at the own rate, they're not talking to each other, right, and that's what you see. How come, how come this is tight and not wide? So maybe the impulse is coming somewhere from the node, right, not all the way lower in the ventricle. So it would be no, uh, no escape rhythm. Rate of 40, right? Junctional is what's the rate? 40 to 60? So maybe it's, it's, it's junctional in here, right? So that's the third degree. Any questions about that? Right, so let's do this one, right? So same thing, right? What's my rate? 30, right? Uh, one other thing I can show you guys if you want to commit this to your memory. For brain decision, it might be good, right? So we know, we know uh, the first the first box is 300, right? The next one is 150, then it's 100, 
75, 60, 50, what's the next one? Okay, and then next one? You're not sure, right? So, let's see if I could now be able to write. So the so so the way the so the the way I would do it is this, and if you want to commit the same number, so 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50. The next one is going to be four, four, 43. The next one is 38, and the next one is 33. How to remember it? So 50. The next one is starts with a four, right? So we remember 40. Why? So the three. Remember that it starts with 300. So just add the three to it. So 43, the next one is going to be 30. I don't remember it's 38. So the, the 3 looks like an 8. So remember it's 38. And the last one is the two, with two threes together. How do they get these numbers? They basically take the big boxes and they divide it. So if you look, right? So we said from here to here was 300. From here to here was, right, 150. So if you do 300 divided by 2, you're going to be at 150. The next box was 100, right? And there's 3, right? So 300 divided by 3 is 100. 300 divided by 4, 75. 300 divided by 5, 60. So that's how they get these numbers. So if you divide by the numbers we got, by 7, by 8, you'll see that those numbers are the correct numbers. So what you want to remember, right? After 50, the next one is what? 43. Right? How I remember it's 40 plus the 300 is the 3. The next one over? 38. 38. How I remember it's 30 plus the 3 looks like an 838. And then the last one is the two threes together, 33. If you remember up until this point, you'll be in good shape, right? So 100 here is going to be 33, right? 33 if you want to be the most accurate. I have what? I have, if you wait for every QRS, but I can see that my PR interval looks like it's long, right? So it's bigger than one whole box, right? So how would you call this rhythm? Uh, so, uh, so there is a first degree block, but I would call this EDR ventricular because we have a P wave in front of every QRS. EDR ventricular rhythm, you do not have P waves preceding them. Right? Sinus Brady with first degree, right? Sinus Brady with first degree, right? Even though the morphology is wide, right? But we still have a P wave in front of every QRS. It's just the abnormality is this is wide, it's being long, plus wide. Why QRS, but for our purposes, right, because of the P wave in front of every QRS, we're going to call the sinus brady cardio with first degree hardball. Okay. Any questions about this one? Alright, so now we get to a rhythm that I could tell right away looks irregular to me, right? So I, can, I, can I do the box method? I can, because if I do the box method here, I'm going to get one rate, different rate here, different rate here. Everybody see that? So what, how would I get my rate? I would have to count, right? So I would have to go. I would have to go one, two, three, four, five. If I count these in, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So heart rate would be one thirty, right? So this rhythm, if I look at my radio regularity, I can tell, right? It's irregular. But not only is it irregular, there's no pattern to it. You see how I move from B to D? There's no pattern at all. The only pattern maybe is in these. Right, these people might have a pattern, but everything here, right, it, it seems going to be off. So underlying irregular, irregular rhythm is these complexes here, right? So the moment you hear irregularly irregular rhythm, I first, I first look, do I have discernible P waves? Do I have discernible P waves? No. So the moment you get a rhythm that is irregularly irregular, no discernible P waves, what's the first rhythm to come to your mind? AFib, right? This is PVC, this is just a bottom B side. So I would call it, I would call it AFib with green focal PVC, so you could say run off B side. Okay. Any questions about this one? Right, so this is uh, what I was basically explaining to you, right? How did they get these <coughs> numbers, right? How did they how did they arrive at uh, you know one 300, 150, 175, 60, 50, 43, 30, 33? They basically divide 300 by the amount of big boxes on the strip. So I would commit to memory up until 33, right? If you want to be the most accurate, you'll take 1,500 and you divide by the small boxes. If you have a calculator, you want to do that, that's fine, right? But when you're getting a strip, your time is of the essence. I would practice this much, right? 
uh, this here, right, they basically show you the entire uh, sequence, right, and how they apply both methods. This one, I think, is the most practical for you guys for a regular rhythm, the one on the top. Right. You could use your, your calipers, so in a, in a pre-hospital setting, the easiest thing to do is if you have calipers, you basically uh, go R to R, and then you measure out your R to R, your PR interval, and so forth. Having calipers are very good. The second best is paper. Where do I get paper? I just print the longest strip of the EKG. Take the other side. Right. Uh, this is some of the morphology of the QRS. So your QRS complexes can look like any of these, right? Uh, usually, what they say is the first negative deflection is Q wave. The first positive defle deflection is the R wave. The second negative deflection is the S wave. However, what if you don't have the first negative deflection? What if right away it goes into positive, right? So then they call it just RS, right? Or if you don't have the negative second wave, they're just going to call it QR. But it's still, this is still going to be your QRS complex that you're measuring, regardless of its morphology. So for the for your purposes, when you do a rhythm strip, for your purpose, it doesn't matter the morphology of it. You're still going to measure from here to here, or from here to here, from here to here for your QRS duration. Where this becomes important is when you do a small EVKG, and you have to interpret, is this, is this a left bundle branch block? Is this, is this a right bundle branch block? Based on the uh, rhythm strip you're doing, you're not going to be doing any of the of this bundle branch stuff. Because unless you have a solid lead, it's not applicable. Make sense? This is just to show you how to measure the QRS duration if you're you missing, if you're missing, let's say, a Q-wave. So you start from here to here. Uh, and the other thing that is, is important for you, you will see, right, some of these rhythms, you will have a rhythm like by jamming, right? By jamming means there's a PVC every second beat, right? So what's the problem with that? Let's say let's say a, a, a person goes from having uh, occasional PVCs to having by jamming it, uh, QRS followed by a PVC. It's not allowing a hard enough time to refill, to, to refill it. The, the, the bigger problem <laughs> is that you can fall on the the, the C wave and get into the uh, DJ. Excellent. R and T phenomenon. The problem is this, right? So you see how this is absolutely refractory. So no impulse that com comes in can trigger the next impulse. But the moment you go on this side, it's relatively refractory. So if you have a bigemini pattern, you have a PVC here. So if they come after every beat, right? You notice eventually it's going to may come a point where they'll trigger them into VTAC detail. And that's what we want to be targeting. So if you see frequent PVC, right, on the EKG, be targeting of that. That's, that's the major point. Any questions about this one? Okay. So uh, if you see PVCs that are becoming more frequent, or like three of them in a row, and they're falling on this period, right, that's what's going to send them into that lethal dysregulation. Okay. Uh, this, uh, uh, I'm going to show you the, uh, once we do the 12 leads, but I'm just going to go through the science of it. Uh, there was a study why 15 lead EKG is something you guys may want to do, right? They basically look uh, at adding, right, to the splitted 12 lead, D4R, D8, and D9 leads, right? So they said the 15 lead provides increased sensitivity uh, for C7 elevation, and why is that, right? And the reason why is that the regular 12 lead, right, it only, it, it does not check your right side of the heart, and it doesn't check the posterior wall, right? So they said because of this, we want to add to the 12 lead, we want to add D8, D9 to look at the posterior wall, and D4R, right, to look at the right side of the heart, the right ventricle. So this is what I'm talking about. Your standard 12 lead EKG does not look at the right ventricle and does not look at the back side of the heart. So you may miss some of the ST segment allegations for, for those things, right? So they said, so where we're going to put these leads, so D4R is going to be filter metastal space, the clavicular line on the right side, and D8, D9, right, so here's of the breakdown, right? So DA gets placed mid scapular line. So we'll show you how it's, how it's done, but basically you find the scapula here, right? Or this side, where the heart is. This is where it's going to be the DA. And then D9 is the left part spinal board. So it's basically right almost next to the spine. It's next to the DA, fits in the top of the So the, the, you first run your standard 12 EKG. Then you take the D4 that is here, right? You're going to move it on the right side. You, you snap off D5 and D6, and then become D8 and D9. And where you're going to move them, you're going to move them to the back, right? Out of the scapula, and the other one is next to your, next to your spinal system of the space. So this, this will look at the back wall of the heart. This looks at the right ventricle. Right? 
So th this was from the other book, but what I'm saying is this, let's say this is your normal EKG. You're going to take off the D4, you're going to put it here. You only need one lead. And then D5 and D6, right? They become D8 and D9, and this is where they go. Okay, make sense? This was another study they looked at uh, doing poly EKGs and then doing the testing, and they said, right, uh, the conclusion was that basically you find more patients who may be going to the cath lab with posterior wall and right side EKGs, right? Why am I telling you only need the one? So, why I'm saying not to do all this, right? The entire right side, only one lead. The AHA study, this was actually published, I think, in the 80s. They said that D4R by itself is, right, ST7 elevation in D4R. The sensitivity was 82.7, and specificity was 76.9. So one lead in itself is good enough. And what we're looking for, right, D4R was, this is the lead on the right side, and uh, this is the elevation we're going to look, right? See how it's elevated here? This was a guy who had an MI on the right ventricle. This was uh, a poor admission. You see how this lead is elevated? And then as he was in the hospital, it stabilized. But this tells me what? The moment I see there is elevation in, on the right side, or, or before R, what is the problem with this? Why is this a problem? Right, the right, uh, right ventricle. Uh, the nitro. Perfect, right? So not nitro lowers your preload. Right side of the heart is preload dependent. That's what we want to make sure we uh, Avoid right, not kill this person just by dropping his preload. Right, uh, we went over this uh, in the lecture, so if you want to hear your question. So for the other things like D1 and D2, you would use a uh, you know they're contiguous leads, that's how we identify them. So for a right ventricular, you just need to identify the one lead. Yeah. So so when I when I'm doing a 15 lead EKG, right, is when I have elevations in two three AVF, the inferior wall, right. So let me go back to this part. So I go. The inferior wall is important, but I don't know if my lesion is higher up. Maybe my lesion is here, and it's also affecting my right ventricle. The standard 12 lead is not going to show me that. The standard 12 lead it only shows me the, the lower wall, the lateral wall, and the anterior wall. I cannot see this until I do the D4R, and I cannot see the posterior, the back wall, until I do the, the D8 to 9. So if I have elevations 2, 3 ABF, and I also may have depressions in uh, anteriorly, D1, D2, D3, I would want to do a 15 lead EKG. So anytime you have elevations 2, 3 AVF, or you have depressions in D1, D2, right, do a four, uh, 15 lead EKG. All right, so this is the D4R lead. This is uh, correlates for the 12 leads. We went over that lecture if you want to take a look at this, right? Uh, and by the way, you only need for D4R to be effective, you only need 0.5 millimeters elevation. It doesn't have to be 1 millimeter. 